Good evening. I am pleased to welcome you now to the fourth annual Rabbi Erwin Groner Memorial Distinguished Lecture, generously sponsored by the family of A. Alfred Taubman. May he always be remembered for a blessing. And I want to take the opportunity to this evening to, in addition uh, to recognizing, in addition to all of our wonderful members and community leaders who are here, we have some distinguished uh, leaders from throughout the community. I want to take a minute just to welcome, I'm sure I'll forget someone, so please accept my apologies, but I'd like to welcome Rabbi Alana Alpert, who is here, Scott Kaufman, the head of the Jewish Federation, along with Julie Zuckerman Tepperman from the Jewish Federation. I would like to welcome uh, Carrie Alterman and Manny Mitchell from the Davidson Foundation, as well as Barb Giles from Jewish Senior Life, and also a board member of the synagogue. Uh, welcome especially to our community leaders who are joining us. We are really pleased and honored that you're here to spend some time with our outstanding uh, members and leaders of our synagogue. We gather together this evening in memory of two special men, both of whom were dedicated to supporting and strengthening the Jewish people in their own unique ways. During his lifetime, Mr. Taubman generously supported so many educational institutions and was a beloved member of this great synagogue. We're grateful to the family of A. Alfred Taubman for continuing to honor the memory of their father and grandfather by sponsoring our Rabbi Erwin Groner Memorial Distinguished Lecture Series. May the name of A. Alfred Taubman always be remembered for a blessing, and may his family continue to perpetuate his name and his legacy among this congregation that he so deeply loved. Of course, we commit our learning this evening to the memory of our beloved and revered teacher, Rabbi Erwin Groner of blessed memory. Rabbi Groner was a past president of the Conservative Movement's Rabbinical Assembly, a community activist, husband, father, and genuine friend and advisor to so many. The rabbi chair of the committee that led to the publication of the Eitz Chaim Chumash that sits in front of you tonight. And as we gather tonight for the Rabbi Erwin Groner Memorial Lecture Series of Distinguished Scholars, we remember Rabbi Groner as both a distinguished scholar himself and as a truly great spiritual leader that guided the congregation Sharetzedek family in particular and Jewish Metro Detroit in general through a half century of assassinations, wars, racism, anti-Semitism, social upheaval, personal tragedies, and cultural revolutions. Rabbi Groner also shepherded us through personal and familial times of joy and sorrow, of celebration and sadness. He made us laugh, he made us think, he taught us to believe, and he led us from strength to strength to strength. We are pleased to have with us today Rabbi Groner's wife, Lipsa, along with his son, Judge David Groner, and David's wife, Judge Amy Hathaway. In our continuing dedication to Rabbi Groner's legacy of Torah scholarship and of congregational excellence, it is now my pleasure to welcome Congregation Shah Tzedek President Jerry Fishman, who will introduce our 2018 Rabbi Erwin Groner Memorial Distinguished Scholar, Rabbi Ed Feinstein. Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi Ed Feinstein is a senior rabbi of Valley Beth Shalom in Encino, California. He also serves on the faculty of the Ziegler Rabbinical School of American Jewish University, the Wexner Heritage Program, the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, and lectures widely around the country. He is the author of several books, including Tough Questions, Jews Ask, A Young Adult's Guide to Building the Jewish Life, as well as Jews and Judaism in the 21st Century, The Human Responsibility, The Presence of God in the Future of the Covenant, and most recently, Chutzpah Imperative, Empowering Today's Jews for a Life that Matters. Rabbi Feinstein was raised in the back of his parents' bakery on the frontiers of West San Fernando Valley. He graduated from the University of California in Santa Cruz, the University of Judaism, Columbia University Teachers College, the Judaism Theological Cemetery, where he was ordained in 1981. Most recently, he received his doctorate in education from the Jewish Theological Cemetery, Sem Seminary <laughs> at Park Avenue Synagogue in New York. Uh, his dissertation was Rabbi Harold Schulweis and the Reinvention of the American Revenant. In 1993, Rabbi Feinstein came to the Valley Beth Shalom at the invitation of the renowned Rabbi Harold Schulweis and succeeded him as the congregation's senior rabbi in 2005. 
Rabbi Feinstein lives in the Epic Center of San Fernando Valley with his wife, Rabbi Nina, mm, excuse me, Nina uh, by Berber Feinstein. Nina was the second woman, or, second woman ordained by the conservative movement. And if I recall, Rabbi, I didn't even indicate she was the first one to enroll also at, D, at JTS. The Feinsteins are blessed with three grown children. An engaging lecturer and storyteller, Rabbi Feinstein unites the ancient Jewish love of ideas with the warmth of Jewish humor. After the lecture, he will answer uh, questions, take questions and answers, uh, and answer questions from you. In memory of Rabbi Erwin Groner and in gratitude of the family of, the, of A. Alfred Taubman, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome Rabbi Feinstein. Down there, I think it would be better. Well, if I stand down there, would that be okay? Would I offend you if I come down here? Yeah? I mean, I can stand here, but I'm a congregational rabbi, so if you close your eyes and fall asleep, I'll feel right at home. <laughs> Thank you so very much for your very warm invitation um, and very warm welcome. And uh, your, your misspeaking is not accidental. We called it the Jewish Theological Cemetery also. So. <laughs> That was actually quite lovely. Um, I'm very privileged to be with you tonight. Um, privileged to be welcome to this wonderful congregation, uh, to this imposing sanctuary. I know you sit here hour after hour during holidays looking at these windows, but for me it's still a sort of oh wow experience. So thank you for allowing me to uh, have this opportunity. It's a very special opportunity. Uh, first of all, thank you to the Talbot family for their generous support of this project and uh, in memory of your father and grandfather, and may his memory be a blessing to you. And to be standing here as the Groner, Rabbi Groner lecturer is a great uh, honor to me as well. Uh, I met Rabbi Groner when I was a young rabbi, just starting out, and I told the story this afternoon. I was sitting by myself in a row at a lecture in a rabbinical assembly convention, and Mrs. Groner was there. And Mrs. Groner would never let anybody sit by themselves. So she came over and we began chatting and she said, come, you need to meet Rabbi Groner, who was at the time the president of the rabbinical assembly. And I was much lower down on the food chain. And he, the warmth and the love and the humor and the sweetness, everything that I had learned about him was so wonderful. So thank you to you and to your late husband, who is a great role model, scholar, and, and, and great rabbi, great model for us all. Thank you to your family for joining us tonight. Um, I am from California. So I'm going to ask your indulgence for a minute. We're going to do a little California thing. Is that OK? Now, don't worry. I will get you through this. Nothing bad will happen. I'd like everybody to stand up. Everybody stand up. Good. Now, there's a person sitting, sitting, standing next to you or in front of you, behind you. Turn to that person and say, good evening. I'm glad you're here. Just try that. Now, now one, one more thing, don't, don't move yet. I promise you, you're going to get to sit for a long time tonight. I'm a rabbi and I came with a lot to say. Now that you have these new friends, you've just met the best smelling Jew in West Bloomfield. Put your arm around that person, put your arm around each other. We gather tonight a generation after the greatest tragedy in Jewish history. And the fact that we gather in this beautiful, magnificent synagogue, in memory of two great Jewish leaders, a great rabbi and a great philanthropist, as friends and fellows to join in Jewish learning is a great gift. And there are two blessings that are recited when we experience this miracle. The first for the joy of learning and the second for the joy of life. So join me please. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kiddushanu Mitzvotah Vetzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam shehechianu v'kiyamanu v'giyanu lazman hazeh. Join me, please. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu v'al kol Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom, shalom aleinu v'al kol Yisrael. Yase shalom. Yase Shalom, 
Shalom Aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom Shalom Aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom Shalom Aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael Thank you for indulging my California impulse. Please be seated. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley and attended a small suburban synagogue and four times a week I was taken to Hebrew school. I didn't go to Hebrew school, I was taken to Hebrew school because while many kids of my generation hated Hebrew school, I loved it. I loved it for a very simple reason. I have three younger brothers. This was the best chance to meet Jewish girls. And whoever I was sat next to, I struck up a conversation and became instant friends and drove teachers crazy. And our teachers were all Israeli expats and they would look down at me and they would go, Yitzchak, that's my Hebrew name, Yitzchak, Sheket, shut up. And I would say, Kane Mora, Kane Mora, yes, teacher, of course, and go on with my conversation. So I would get a second, Yitzchak, Sheket, be quiet. Kane Mora, Kane Mora, and I'd go on talking, and finally she'd say, Yitzchak, La Sifria, go to the library, which was just fine by me, because the synagogue had a wonderful library, and that's where I really learned my Jewish lessons, because I read my way through that library, and at six o'clock, the old guys would come from Minyan, and they'd let me smoke cigars and taste a little schnapps, and we'd dive in Mariv, and by the time my mom and dad came to pick me up, I was in a wonderful mood. <laughs> this was my Jewish upbringing. Except one day in fourth grade, I got my first Yitzchak Sheket, and my second Yitzchak Sheket, and finally La Sifria, and I jumped up and took my books and was headed out the door when I heard the most chilling word in the Hebrew language. Rega, which means, hang on a minute. Kane Mara, yes, teacher? You're going to the library. Yes? Do something for me. Sure, anything. What would you like me to do? You're going to the library. Write a book report. Okay, I'm good at that. I know how to write book reports. Can I choose any book or do you have one in mind? And she got this conspiratorial smile on her face and she said, yeah, the Bible. <laughs> Write a book report about the Bible. I said, the Bible? You can't write a book report about the Bible. She said, it's a book, right? Well, yeah, good. Then you can write a book report. Have it ready at 6.30. So off to the library I went to write a book report about the Bible. I got a piece of that, remember that wide line paper we used to have in school? and a big number three pencil, and at the top I wrote my Hebrew name, Yitzchak Sheket, right? It's my Hebrew name. And then the form of a book report, name of the book. I cheated a little bit. I took down the Torah. I wrote the Torah, author, uh-oh. Just write unknown, publisher, Jewish Publication Society, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Setting of the book, well, somewhere in the Middle East, main character of the book, plot line of the book, conflict, resolution of the conflict, and the all-important question, would you recommend this book to your friends? <laughs> and I started writing that book report. And it occurs to me that I've been writing that book report for the rest of my life. What, after all, is the Bible about? What is the narrative arc of the biblical canon? And for that matter, what's the narrative arc of all of Judaism? What, who is the main character of the Bible and of Judaism? What is the conflict at the heart of our story? How is it resolved? What do we learn? What's the moral of this story? What is the meaning of Jewish existence? We don't ask that question. If you ask your rabbi, you'll ask him about sukkahs, or about Pesach dishes, or you'll ask him an important halachic question about how we bow for the aleinu. 
but we very rarely ask our rabbis, what is the narrative arc of Jewish existence? What is its deepest meaning? First, we don't ask that question because our tradition doesn't direct us to ask that question. Our tradition is much better at asking questions how than asking questions why. You know this, because in the Pesach Seder, there are four children who sit in front of us and they ask questions. The kid who asks, how do we do Pesach? What are the laws and traditions and rules and regulations of making the Seder? Him, we honor with the title, the Chacham. The kid who asks the why question, Mazelachem, what's this mean to you? How does the narrative of the Passover fit into your personal narrative? How does it guide and shape your life? How does it shape your social and ethical and political vision? The kid who asks the why question, we castigate him as the Rasha, as the wicked kid. But the truth is, he asks the only relevant question at the table. Why are we doing all of this? We're not good at answering that question. We're uncomfortable with it. And in particular, at this historical moment, we're particularly uncomfortable with that question. Look, the greatest moment of destruction in all of Jewish history was the destruction of the Holy Temple in the year 70. The Holocaust matches it or exceeds it. The greatest moment of redemption in all of Jewish history was Yitziat Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt. The recreation of the State of Israel matches it or exceeds it. The difference is that Yitziat Mitzrayim and Churban Abayit, the exodus from Egypt and the destruction of the Temple, took place 1,500 years apart. The Holocaust and the recreation of Israel took place in the experience of one generation within 10 years. How does a people make any sense of its existence in the world in the shadow of a Holocaust and in the light of the recreation of Jewish sovereignty? And all of that, in addition to living the most secure, free, prosperous lives in diaspora that any Jewish community has ever lived. No wonder we don't ask the question, why? What's the meaning of our Jewishness? But there's a terrible tragedy to this, because that's precisely the question that young Jews are asking. Look, there's a fourth kid at the table. He's the one I never understood. She'eno yodea lisho, the kid who doesn't know how to ask a question. What kind of kid, what kind of Jewish kid doesn't ask a question? Well, at least you ask, like, when do we eat, you know? But think about that for a moment. It's not because he's dumb or mute. The kid who doesn't ask the question was yesterday's Rasha. Yesterday he came to our table and he said, what is the meaning of Jewish existence? Why should I want to be Jewish? What is the truth that your tradition stands for? What is the moral of the story of the Jewish people? Why am I Jewish? And we told him, sit down and shut up, we have to get on with the Seder. So he did. So he did. So he sat down and he shut up. And that's why he doesn't ask a question at the Seder. In fact, in many families, he doesn't show up at all. He doesn't come to the Seder. According to the Pew Report of 2013, when asked, what is your current religion? Among the 5.5 million American Jews, 20% said none. Not Orthodox, not Conservative, not Reform, not Reconstructionist, not Renewal, not Zionist, not Anti-Zionist, not Left, not Right, none. None Jews. Jews who refuse to identify with anything Jewish at all. Because when they asked us the question, why am I Jewish, we, shed, we said, shah, still, don't ask. It's time to ask that question. It's time to ask the question of my book report. What is all this about? Because if we can't answer that question for our children, there's absolutely no reason for them to step into this building or any building like it and identify themselves as Jews. So what's the answer to the question? Let's begin at the beginning. In the beginning, there were two. 
the great god of the slow-moving earth waters, whose name was Ea, and the great god of the sky water, whose name was Tiamat. And the sky waters and the earth waters mingled, and out of those waters came all the gods. This is a story called Enuma Elish. It was the Babylonian, Akkadian, Mesopotamian creation story. It was Abraham's bedtime story. We only discovered it in 1837 when we, when we excavated Babylon and discovered in the great library of Babylon the cuneiform tablets that gave us the mythology of ancient Mesopotamian civilization. But once we excavated it and translated those tablets, we made a fabulous discovery about the meaning of the Torah. In the beginning, there was Tiamat in the sky and Ea on the ground, and their waters mingled, and from their waters came all the gods, the story teaches. Gods of light and darkness, gods of war and peace, gods of fertility and barrenness, gods of every phenomenon that human beings encounter. And the gods fill the world with commotion, with conflict, with noise. And Mama Tiamat, she got tired of all this noise. She wanted to go back to the simple peace of just her and her consort. And so she conspired to destroy all the gods. The gods met in council. They were nervous because Mama was all powerful. And they asked, who will fight the mother goddess? And up stood Marduk, god of thunder and lightning. And he said, I will fight the mother goddess if you crown me king of the gods upon my victory. And so it was decided. And Marduk went to battle with his mother. That is to say, 5,000 years before Sigmund Freud, a boy and his mother went to war. They battled for many, 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 many generations. And finally, Marduk had an upper hand. He crammed a giant thunderbolt into the goddess's mouth, and with another thunderbolt, he cast it into her belly and tore her to pieces. Tiamat was dead, and he took part of Tiamat's body and put it in the sky, and part of Tiamat's body and put it beneath the earth, which is why water falls from above and water rises from below. And now the gods all celebrated their liberation from the destructive mother goddess. But soon they made a terrifying discovery. Mama did the shopping. There was no food. And they came to their new king, Marduk, and they said, what shall we eat? Who will serve us? So Marduk went to the banks of the Tigris and Euphrates and took the mud and mixed it with the body of the dead goddess, the water, and formed of the mud and the water of the goddess, man, the human being. And he charged the man with this charge, serve the gods, literally. Offer sweet smelling sacrifices that will nourish, nourish the gods. And it was evening and it was morning. That was Abraham's bedtime story. We now understand that. And because we know that story now, we know that the Bible was written as a polemic against that story. Because that story teaches a particular view of the world. A myth is not to be taken literally. A myth is a description of reality. And that reality teaches that we live in a world with all these gods. They're all at war with each other. Commotion, noise, conflict, caprice, desires, appetites, impulses, all at war with each other. And you, human being, you haven't got a chance. Anything you dream, anything you build, anything you hope for, anything you aspire to, anything that you create in the world, those gods will come and destroy it. Human life is much like little kids playing at the shore, playing on the beach. They build sandcastles and turrets and cities and streets. Comes the tide, it washes it all away. And the next group of kids comes the next day and builds up, and the tide washes it away. So Shah, still, be quiet. Don't try too hard. Don't hope too much. Don't dream too deeply, because you can't make a change in the world anyway. That's the truth. That's the moral of that myth. 
And against that myth, the Bible came and said, no! Reshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, one God, one loving, creative God created all. Not many, but one. And that God created a world that has order, that has sense to it and brings the human being into that world as a co-creator of that world. You can dream. You can hope. You can build because you were charged by the Creator to be the partner in the work of creation. That's the meaning of Genesis. That's the, that's the polemic. But you have to understand what the polemic was fighting against because that myth, like all myths, never went away. That myth comes back every time the world seems to be changing. And people feel like their lives are out of control. And they can't, uh, they can't govern the conditions of the change. And so they adopt an attitude of passivity. Because the myth says, you can't change anything. You're only human. So sit quietly. Don't hope too much. Don't strive too hard. Don't reach too high. You can't change anything. That's the way the world is. The world is governed by forces far beyond you. Genesis came and said, no. As a parody, as a sort of making fun of the Mesopotamian myth, the Torah says, you are created in the image of the Creator. And given the powers of creation, you can create a world. That's what God expects you to do. You are empowered and you are responsible. I call this chutzpah. That's really chutzpah, you know? Now we know the word chutzpah. You all know the word chutzpah. Chutzpah, you all know, is a Yiddish word. And in Yiddish it means nerve, temerity, you know, cheekiness, the, the classic definition given by Leo Rostin in the Joys of Yiddish is the kid who kills his parents and then throws himself on the mercy of the court as an orphan. And that was funny until somebody actually did it. You know, you know what chutzpah really is. You know what chutzpah, remember the story, the old joke about mama who takes her babela to the beach, to the shore, and the kid's playing at the shore, and comes along a giant tsunami and takes baby out to sea. You know the story? And Mama turns her eyes toward heaven and says, How can you do this to me? You know what I've suffered? You know what I've put up with? You can't do this to me. I refuse to accept it. Comes along another tsunami and drops the baby right in her arms. And she turns her eyes toward heaven and says, He had a hat. That's chutzpah. But you know, the word chutzpah is actually older than Yiddish. The word chutzpah is older than Yiddish. It occurs in the Talmud thousands of years before Yiddish was invented. And in the Talmud, it has a different meaning. In the Talmud, it means irrepressible life, irrepressible strength, irrepressible vitality. The example is given in the Yerushalmi, in the Jerusalem Talmud, that the land of Israel, even though it's been conquered over and over and over again, still gives birth to beautiful flowers every springtime because it's infused with chutzpah. We are the bringers of chutzpah. That idea of the human being empowered by the Creator to create a world and responsible for the nature of the world in which we live, that's the greatest Jewish chutzpah. And I would suggest to you that that is the answer to my book report's question. Look, the, the Bible you all know, the Bible, at least Genesis, is a drama in three acts. The Creator creates a man, in his image, puts him in the Garden of Eden, and right away that man disappoints him because that man chooses his independence over his sense of loyalty to God. So God throws us out of the Garden. And what happens is we continue to choose individuation. Instead of choosing solidarity with one another, we choose individuation and we fill the world with violence and awfulness and ugliness. And God says, to hell with this, I'll destroy it all. And just before he destroys it all, his eye catches one righteous man in the world, Russell Crowe.
no, Noah, Noah. And God says, maybe I can try again with him. I couldn't create a man to be my partner in the creation of a world of goodness. Maybe I can choose one. And he chooses Noah and the animals in the ark, starts the world all over again, and Noah begins again. But once again, man fills the world with violence. Man fills the world with ugliness. God says, I couldn't choose one to be my partner, and I couldn't make one to be my partner. Maybe I could teach one. Can I teach a human being to be my partner in the creation of a world of goodness? So he chooses a man. Now the, the, the Midrash of the Talmud is full of all the reasons why God chooses Abraham. But I can tell you the reason why God chose Abraham. It was completely random. He chose Abraham because his name began with A. And his name in Zachary, he never would have gotten chosen. Because that really is the essence of the book of Genesis. It's eeny, meeny, miny, him. I'm going to choose this guy. And I'm going to see if I can take a random man, strip him of his culture, strip him of his identity, and create of him a vessel of divine blessing in the world. So the story of the creation of the Jewish people is God's third attempt to find a partner in the creation of a world of goodness. And what does God say to the man? You have these sheets that I gave you? Take a look at the sheet. You can open the Chumash too to Genesis chapter 12, but it's all reprinted here nicely by the lovely people of the staff of the synagogue. Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, Lech Lecha, get going. Get going. Lech Lecha, go forth from your land, from your birthplace, from your father's house, to the land that I will show you. And I'll make of you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, and you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And through all your families, through you, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Listen to that carefully. If you open the mythology, of any people in the world, you'll read a similar story. Open any mythology. And the Bible knows you know mythology. The Bible knows you read Joseph Campbell. The Bible knows that you know Greek mythology and Roman mythology and Norse mythology and Navajo mythology and Polynesian mythology and that in all of those mythologies there's the same story. God chooses, the God chooses a man, says to him, you're my hero, You'll conquer the world for me. And in all the mythologies of the world, the God says, I will make of you a great nation. Okay, nice. Mazel tov. And I'll bless you. That's nice too. And I'll make your name great, of course. But it's the next phrase that occurs in no other mythology on earth. This is what makes our story a miracle. What makes it unique. In only one mythology, the Bible's mythology, does the God say to the man, not that you'll conquer the world, but you, hey Abraham, be a blessing. Be a blessing. Now stop for just a second, take a breath. This is the best bar mitzvah speech ever given. Because what do we want to say to a 13 year old kid? I hope you go to U of M or, or Michigan State. I'm not going to take signs. Right? I, I hope you go to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or Northwestern. I hope you become rich, famous, powerful, important, and creative. I really do. But you know something? You know what will really make your life successful and make me proud of you? If you're a blessing. I know what it means to say a blessing. What does it mean to be a blessing? Is there somebody in the world who if somebody mentioned their name, you would go, ah, that's my blessing. That person my blessing. I mean, just if I can just take a moment out of this talk, your husband was a blessing to this place. You know that. Because when this synagogue suffered the greatest tragedy of any American synagogue, its rabbi was taken on this bima in front of the congregation. Your husband came back from camp. He was up in Tamarack or someplace. Young man. He was a young man. He was the second pulpit. He was in Little Rock before this. And he stood on this bima and he brought comfort and strength and, and reassurance and faith back to this community. That's what it means to be a blessing. That's what it means to be a blessing. Is there someone in your life who showed up at just the right moment? 
Someone in your life who held your hand when you were afraid. Someone in your life who gave you just the words you needed or just the reassurance you needed or just the strength you needed. Is there someone in your life who you would say, oh, my blessing. God says to the Jewish people, be a blessing. So to each one of us, that's the measure of a human existence. It's not what college you go to. It's not your SAT score, your net worth. Be a blessing. And in case you miss it, they see, he says it again. Everything in the Bible is repeated. That's why rabbis are redundant, right? And repetitious and redundant. I will bless those who bless you. That's nice. I'll curse those who curse you. That's, by the way, even better. I put that on a bumper sticker on my car. And, and through you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Listen to that. You will be the vessel of blessing for whom? God doesn't say what you think he's going to say. You think God's going to say, be a blessing for me. God doesn't say that. God doesn't say you've got to obey me. He doesn't say that either. What does he say? I want you to be a blessing to whom? To all the families of the earth. So let me ask you a quiz question. You ready? Is this a statement of Jewish particularity or a Jewish universalism? Answer is yes. That was the right answer. Because what you have here is universalism and particularity wrapped together. The moment we are chosen by God is the moment we are given responsibility to go out and heal the world. And the gesture of healing the world begins with our own chosenness. You can't have one without the other. To force a choice between the two is a false choice. Because Jewish particularity must lead to Jewish universalism, otherwise it becomes tribal chauvinism. But Jewish universalism must always be rooted in particularity because the place I learn to love the world is the family I'm raised in, and the people I'm raised in, and the community I'm raised in, and the stories and narratives and rituals and rites and ethics of my own community. That's where I learn to be a blessing to the world. Hey, bracha, be a blessing. So man goes out and be, Abraham goes out and tries to be a blessing. But then the Torah notices something. If God needs him so much, how much does God really need him? What an interesting idea. God can't just bless the world. God needs people to be a blessing in the world. How much? What's it mean? What's the nature of this covenant, of this arrangement? So now the Bible's going to mess with that idea, which is the most wonderful messing, the most wonderful story of chutzpah in the whole of the Torah. It's in Genesis 18. You got it here? You remember the story? Abraham wants one thing out of life. What does he want? A son. Every night he goes to bed, please God, give me Bill. I just want a boy named Bill. No, that was Carousel. I want a boy named, I want a son. Right, so what does God do? God sends three angels. Remember, the first angel comes and shows up and says, Mazel Tov, you're going to be parents. Sarah, remember, is 90 years old. She says, have you seen my old man? <laughs> I'm 90, he's 100. Viagra won't come along for many, many, many years. You can't be serious. God says, you want to watch? <laughs> Don't mess with God. <laughs> now there's two angels left. And the two angels now confront Abram. The men set out from there. I'm on the sheet now, you see it? The men from, set out from there towards Sodom. Abraham walking with them to see them off. Look at verse 17, ready? Now the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm gonna do? Everybody stop, look up. What's the answer to that question? Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm gonna do? Does God have to give Abraham an accounting of what he's gonna do? Does God have to explain himself? Answer, you're shaking your head. The answer is, you're exactly correct. The answer is no. Why not? Because he's God. What the hell fun is it if you're God? You gotta explain yourself. Me, like you, I'm married, right? You married, right? So I walk around with one of these all day long. Why? So my wife can call me five, six, seven, 20 times a day going, where are you? In fact, she just called, there it is. Where are you? And I'll send back some idiot sarcastic answer, you know? 
But the answer, the truth is, this is my accountability. We are married. We are in covenant. She has a right to know where I am and what I'm doing. Does God have to answer to anybody? Does God have a wife? A husband? No. Except this is the point of the story. Once God enters into covenant with Abraham, God enters into a whole new realm of being. If you're going to have a partner, and his job is to carry your blessing into the world, he deserves an explanation. And if you're going to zap a major metropolitan area somewhere in the Middle East, you got to explain it to him. So God starts ruminating. Shall I tell Abraham what I'm going to do? Since he's going to become a great and populous nation, and all the nations of the earth are to bless themselves by him, for I singled him out, that he may instruct his children and posterity to do the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right? If he's going to do justice and righteousness, he's got to know why I go around smiting cities. So what happens? The men go down to Sodom, and Abraham remains standing in front of God. Look at verse 23. The Hebrew is Vayigash Avraham, which literally means he stepped up to the plate. Only the writers of the Bible didn't know baseball because it was a little early. It means he steps into the encounter. And Abraham says to God, he says this to God, will you sweep away the innocent along with the guilty? What if there be 50 innocent in the city? Will you then wipe out the place and not forgive it for the sake of the innocent 50 in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to bring death upon innocent as guilty, so that innocent and guilty fare alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do justice. That's chutzpah. What did he just do? He just called out God. Look, look at that speech again, right? Are you really going to do this? Are you really going to do this? You're going to just kill the whole city indiscriminately? The line I like is number 25. The Hebrew isn't far be it from you. The Hebrew is much earthy, much more earthy. The Hebrew is chalila lecha. Now, anybody here have Yiddish speaking grandparents? Right? When my parents would go away and my bubby and Aunt Sarah would come stay with us, Tante Sarah, right? They would catch me ready to beat the life out of my little brother. And my bubby would come into the bedroom and she'd see me there with my fist raised over my brother, and she wouldn't say a thing. Bubby was four foot nothing, a little Lithuanian lady with a bun of gray hair and these shining blue eyes, and she'd just give me the look. Did you have a Bubby who did that? And then she'd shake her head, and she'd whisper three words in Yiddish. She'd say, Shanda, Funacherpa, and then she'd say, Fe. And I'd drop to my knees and I'd say, Bubby, hit me with a stick. Just don't give me fat. Because to get, to, 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 to imagine that, that I disappointed this poor woman, this poor woman who was such a victim of Jewish history and her one, her oldest einicle, her oldest grandson, just disappointed her. Fat. That's what Abraham says to God. Shanda for Necherpa, Feh! I'm shame on you! Shame on you! You're better than that! Look at the next of the verse, right? To do such a kadavar said, to do such a thing. Lahamit Sadiqim Rasha. To kill the guilty together with the innocent. And then the line in Hebrew is Vahaya Kat Karasha. So that like innocent and guilty, right and wrong. Good and evil is undifferentiated in your world. Is that the world you wanted? Is that the world you wanted? A world where good and evil, right and wrong, innocence and guilt have no distinction? A world of moral nothing? Is that the world you want? Chalila lecha feh. Hashofet kol ha'aretz lo yasem mishpat. The judge of all the earth doesn't hold justice. Now it's the next line that makes me Jewish. Because I'll tell you what the next line should say. There's a 10 second movie I want you to watch. I want you to go home tonight. It's not Shabbos, it's good. Go home tonight, if you have a computer, Google Bambi versus Godzilla. It's a 10 second movie, I swear to God. It exists, it's on the computer, you'll find it. And it shows you this little land 
a Bambi with the little birdies and the squirrels and the bunny rabbits. And here's little Bambi frolicking around, and out of the sky comes a foot. That's the whole movie. That's the whole movie. That's what should have happened here. Why does God put up with this? Why does God accept this kind of rebuke from a man of flesh and blood? Who does he think he is? Who does he think he is? He thinks he's God's covenantal partner. So what does God say? God says, okay, you're right. Now imagine that. God says, you're right. You're right. God says, okay, if I find 50, I'll let you, I'll forgive the whole city. And then Abraham says, yeah, but 50, 50, what if five are missing? They went golfing. You're going to destroy a city? He sold enough camels in the shuk of Beersheba to know that once you get a price, now we can do some business, right? 50. What about 45? Would you save it for 45? If you can save it for 50, you'd surely save it for 45. Do I hear 45? I see 45. Do I see 40? Do I see 40? I see 40 in there. Do I see 30? Do I see 30? Do I, I see 30? Do I see 20? Do I see 20? 20? Do I see 10? Do I see 10 anywhere in the room? Do I see 10 going once, going twice, sold to the God of the universe. An absurd story. That a crazy crazy, absurd story. The question you've got to ask is, what kind of religious universe is suggested by this story? What does it say about being human in the world? What does it say about being a Jew in the world? What does it say about my sense of responsibility and my empowerment? It says you are obligated to fight for a divine dream of justice, even if you have to fight against God himself. There is no power in the world that should ever stand in front of you and cow and stuff you down and force you to resign your sense of justice. None. Not even God himself. And the story is purposely absurd so that you'll understand that this is what God expects. Notice that God doesn't get mad. Why doesn't God get angry? I get angry. I had a bar mitzvah kid once tell me, you know, I don't want any of it. I revoked his bris, I swear to God, right? I have that power. You'll, you'll have it soon too, it's great, right? The RA, it's, they send you a letter, you, you know. You no, I'm kidding, I didn't do that. But, but you know, wait, who wants this talk? And by the way, in, in case you don't understand how radical this is, there is another story in the Bible which is the exact opposite. It's a book that we Jews never read, but it's in our Bible. It's called Job. It's about a man who suffers terribly, terribly. Everything in life that's beautiful and good and worthy is taken from him. His wealth, his children, his health, everything that makes his life worth living is taken from him. And he turns his eyes toward heaven and he screams to God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? And at the end of the book of Job, anyone ever read to the end of the book of Job? You know what God says to him at the end of the book? God says, shut up. Sheket Yitzchak, right. Shut up. And you know what happens? It's the saddest thing in the world. If you'll turn to the last, to the next page. This is the end of the book of Job, right? The Lord replied to Job, out of the tempest, who is this who darkens counsel, speaking without knowledge? Gird your loins like a man. I will ask, and you inform me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who do you think you are anyway? You're just a human being. You're nobody. You're a nothing. You have no right to question me. I'm God. And at the end of the book, look at chapter 40. The Lord said to, in reply to Job, Shall one who should be disciplined complain against Shaddai? Shaddai is God. He who arraigns God must respond. Job said in reply to the Lord, I know you can do everything, that nothing you propose is impossible for you. Who is this who obscures counsel without knowledge? Indeed, I spoke without understanding of things beyond me, which I didn't know. Hear now and I will speak. I ask and you inform me. I had heard you with my ears, now I see you with my eyes. Therefore, I recant and relent being but dust and ashes. Job says, I give up. 
Job says, I ask for justice, I ask for righteousness, I realize that you, God, I can't question you, I resign. And what's really interesting, by the way, just in case you missed the connection, is only two places in the whole Hebrew Bible where a person describes himself as being but dust and ashes. Abraham in chapter 18 of Genesis, and Job in chapter 42 of Job. But the meaning of the phrase is completely opposite. In Job, it's a sign of his smallness. He says, listen, I'm dust and ashes. I'm just a person. I have no right to question you, God. But in Genesis, it's meant ironically. Abraham says, even though I'm dust and ashes, I'm still going to ask you this question. Now, what's the difference? What's the difference between Job and Abraham? What's the difference between the religious universe described by Job and the religious universe described by Abraham? What's the difference in the way that you walk the world if you're an, a, a disciple of Job or if the way you walk the world if you're a disciple of Abraham? If you're Job, you walk the world in resignation and surrender. You see injustice, you see the brokenness of the world and you say, I can't do anything about it. It's a lot like that Mesopotamian myth. I'm just a human being. What do you want of me? I give up. Because Job is ultimately man of nature. And nature has no morality. But Abraham is covenanted. Abraham says, I am only dust and ashes, but I am a soul. And you have given me responsibility and empowered me to be your partner in the creation of a world of justice, and therefore I want to know why the world is so unjust. If you follow Job, you'll have a life of peace and tranquility and serenity. I can offer you that. If you follow Abraham, you'll have no peace and serenity and tranquility. Serenity is not a Jewish value. Nobody gets serenity in synagogue, at least not if synagogue's running properly. A little sleep maybe, but not serenity. But, Job, but Abraham has something that Job will never have. He has dignity. He has dignity because he stands for something. He stands for a divine dream of a world of justice. A divine dream, God's dream of a world of goodness. And he understands that he is a partner in the creation of that dream. I think the greatest creation of Jewish culture is just that. Is the way we understand ourselves. We often talk about the greatest creation of Jewish culture is ethical monotheism. I think ethical monotheism is a support structure to understand what kind of God I need to believe in if I want to see myself as a co-creator of a world of justice. That's really what the Jewish tradition came to teach. So I have this to offer you. I have this to offer you. Practicing Judaism will not make you thin. Trust me on this. Practicing Judaism will not make you rich. Practicing Judaism, embracing it, making it part of your own story, will not make you popular. It will not make you important. I'm not even sure it makes you happy. I'm thinking about that one. It's not designed to do any of that. Practicing Judaism is designed to only do one thing, to give you a life that matters. To give you a life that matters. Because the opposite of Judaism is not atheism or secularism or assimilation. It's certainly not Christianity or Islam. The opposite of Judaism is Job. Is the person who looks at the injustice of the world, the brokenness of the world, and says, it's not my problem. The person who says what is is what inevitably must be. It can never be changed. The person who isn't willing to shake a fist and get angry at the brokenness of the world has lost the message of this faith. Because in that sense of rage and the passion and the activism and the commitment that comes with that, that's where we as a people, that's where we have always gained our sense, our role, our purpose in the world. That's the meaning and purpose of Jewish existence. So would I recommend this book to my friends? You bet. Because we're living through another one of these moments when the world seems out of control, 
And greater forces, forces greater than ourselves, seem to be in control of the conditions of our existence. And people seem to be withdrawing into their own privatism, their own privacy, backing away from a sense of commitment, backing away from a sense of engagement. And the Jewish tradition says, don't give up on God's world. That's the reason you're here. And the dignity that comes with being a Jew is the dignity of taking responsibility, gaining a sense of the full empowerment of being a human being. Would I recommend this book to my friends? With all my heart. Thanks very much. Now, I would be very happy to answer any question about anything in the world except American League Baseball, okay? Because I live in a National League city. And if you have a counter sermon or a question, I'll do my very, very best to answer it. And if I don't answer it, at least I'll be entertaining for a few more minutes. Yes, please. Tell me your name. Thank you. Could you stand up so I can hear it? Are you able to uh, practice the Kuna law without following the 613 laws? How does that help? Is it necessary? Can you separate it? Some rabbis think that if you do the Kuna law, you don't follow the laws, you can't do that. Or can you? How are they related? The, the, in, in the tradition of the Jewish people, tikkun olam and observance of mitzvah, what we might say particularism and universalism, is not a choice. Your commitment to the world and your commitment to our own is not a choice. It, they go together. They fit together. One leads to the other, and they lead back, and they reinforce each other. I don't, if you ask me, who do you love more, your own kids or the kids of the world? I love my own kids, but because I love my own kids, I can sympathize with a mother who misses her kids in another place. Because I love my people, I understand people who, who, who feel like their people are threatened. Because I understand the rituals and rites of my tradition, I fight for the liberty of others to practice the ritual and rites of theirs. I have learned my tikkun olam ethics and my vision of a just world in my Jewish family. My conscience was shaped by my learning of Torah and my learning of Jewish ethics. And that conscience tells me to go out in the world and, and attack the unrighteousness and the injustice of the world. But I constantly need to return to regain my strength. See, the problem with giving up on the Jewish thing and just going out and being an activist, I had that in my generation. You're probably my generation, too. And there were lots and lots of people in my generation who went out to, dis to, to fix the world. And they became grossly disillusioned. And the worst thing in the world is an activist who's become disillusioned because they become cynical and bitter. So what do you do when you go into the world and you meet the world's brokenness? You come to shul and you make a prayer. And it's an interesting thing what we pray for. You know, you never ask God, dear God, fix the world for me. Amen. We don't make that prayer. We even, even the prayer we just said. Oseh shalom bim romav. The one who makes peace in the cosmos. Who ya'aseh shalom not bishvileinu, but rather aleinu. You make peace up there, we'll make peace down here. You give me the tools to make peace. You give me the wisdom, the resolution, the courage, the vision, I will take it from here. My teacher, Rabbi Shoais, who was my mentor, used to wonder how he prays. He prayed like a chassid. And I said to him, what do you pray? He said, I found a very simple way to pray. Every time I make a bracha, I add two words. Through me. Baruch, blessed be the one, Amotzi Lechem in Aretz, who brings bread to the earth. Through me. Blessed is the one who makes peace. Through me. Blessed is the one who heals the sick. Through me. The prayer gives me the strength to return to the fight. Look, I'm a cancer patient. 
I, 20 years ago, I was told I was going to die. I'm incredibly, incredibly, incredibly lucky to have found the right doctor who had the right medicine and the right surgery and the right community. Everything worked out right. I'm in textbooks. That's how, that's how where I should have been. Right? And I, looked at, and I looked in the eyes of my doctor. I used to have to go see the doctor. First you go see every two weeks, then every four weeks. I still see my doctors. They still invite me in. You know why? Because I look in their eyes and I see this poor schnook. Here's a kid, this poor guy. He's the smartest kid in every school he ever attended. Smartest kid in elementary school, smartest kid in high school, top of his class in college, top of his class in medical school, top of his fellowship group in oncology, right? This brilliant kid, poor kid didn't get to make a living till he was 35, right? And then he enters a field in which he's gonna lose half of his patients. And today oncology, I mean, in certain fields you can, get, you can get better than 50%, but not much. How does this poor guy, I don't know, anybody here an oncologist? How does this poor guy deal with, deal with the despair? So I realized that the reason I was being called in for appointments wasn't because I needed to see the doctor, it was because the doc needed to see me. Because I would sit with my doctor and I would remind my doctor, you do holy work. You bring fathers and mothers back to their kindelach. You bring grandpas and grandmas back to life. You give families hope. Don't forget that's why you went into this medicine field. You did not go into this medicine field to make insurance companies happy. Trust me on this one. The, the, the purpose of the infrastructure of mitzvah and prayer and learning of Torah is to give us the resolution to do the work in the world which God has asked us to do. And the work in the world that we do, that God has asked us to do, gives sense to the mitzvot that we carry out, gives sense to the Torah that we learn, gives sense to the prayers that we say. The two have to go together. It's not a question of do I go to shul or do I feed the poor? You go to shul and you feed the poor. You give, to, you give money to the shul, lots of it. How's that? And you give money to the, to the, to the local food bank. Because you have to do both, because that's what, that's what the Torah said, you will be a blessing. That's what it meant. You can't hide yourself in a cave and just be Jewish. There was a rabbi who tried this after the, in the Talmud. A guy who said, I'm sick of the world, I'm gonna sit in a cave and study Torah all the time. And God said to this guy, get out of the cave. I need you in the world. Because that's not Jewish. The two have to go together. It, it's a false choice to have to choose one or the other. I hope I answered your question. I think someone on this side had a hand up. Sir, tell me your name, sir. Uh, Steve Weisberg. Hey, Steve Weisberg. Yeah. God. Yeah. But when his wife says to him, send Hagar away, suddenly he loses his chutzpah. You know what's really Where good? is yeah. the... Uh, Great question. Uh, what is the lesson in that? Yes. You will find one of the tropes, one of the themes of the Torah is men are wusses. <laughs> Wuss is a technical term in the Bible. I don't know if you knew this. In the very first story of Genesis, what does God, Abraham, God, God tells Adam, don't eat from the tree, right? So Eve gives him the fruit, they eat from the tree. God says to Abraham, to Adam, Ayeka, where are you? Adam says, I was hiding because I was naked. God said, who told you were naked? Did you eat from my tree? What does Adam say? The woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit. Man is a wuss. Abraham's told by his wife, kick the kid out. You understand what that means, by the way? You don't have any deserts in Michigan, do you? In LA, in California, we have the whole damn thing is a desert, California, right? We stole the water from Colorado, otherwise we'd have no civilization. But if you stand at the edge of the Mojave Desert and you look out into the into, you know, Joshua tree, you understand what Abraham did to Hagar and Ishmael? Yeah, horrible ain't the word. It's, horrible isn't even the word. You're exactly right. And by the way, what happens is, you know, he's, he feels conscience, so he goes to God and says, what should I do? Which means he had pangs of conscience about it. And God should have told him, well, I would tell what God would tell him, you know. Don't do this. But 
You know, sometimes we don't do what we're supposed to do, we do what we want to do. That's another male trait. I don't know if any of the men in the room have ever had that experience, right? And he does what he wants to do, not what he should do. You find all through the Bible people who do what they want to do, not what they should do. And I think part of the reason that story is there, so you can ask that question. Because think for just a minute. Had that story not been there, what would have happened? So Isaac and Ishmael would have grown up together and would have shared the covenant. Isn't that what we want most now? For the last 70 years, we've been fighting the children of Ishmael over whose, who, whose covenant is it. If we'd shared the covenant, it would have been a different world. Right? I mean, that, so this is a story about the failure of parenthood. The Bible, by the way, isn't filled with beautiful pictures of Jewish families that are gorgeous and lovely. There's no Gerber baby box in the Bible. You can quote me on that. Every family in the Bible is dysfunctional. Part of the reason I think is that there, so you'll read it and go, oh, my family's not so bad. I haven't killed any of my kids today. <laughs> right? Every story in the Bible is a dysfunctional family, and you read it and go, Aah! this wouldn't be the story. If I were writing the Bible, I'd have made us look a lot better. I swear to God, I'd have made us look a lot better. I would have put nicer stories. When I take pictures of my kids and put them in the photo album, they're all the good ones. I Photoshop a little, take 10 pounds off, you know? I wouldn't put stories in, but the Torah is all about screwy, dysfunctional families. The question is, can we find a way to love each other despite the dysfunctional families that we live in? That's the question. So one of the most encouraging lines in the whole Bible is one of the most obscure. Abraham dies. What happens next? Remember the story? Abraham dies. He's 127 years old, right? He dies. And what happens next? It says, Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, gathered to bury him. Can you imagine that? Both sons he tried to murder. You think you're a lousy father. Both sons he tried to murder. When the people call, when the tradition called him Avram Avinu, I think they were kidding. You know? Both sons. He tried to murder both of them, but they both came to bury their dad. Why? Because somewhere along the line you have to find forgiveness. Otherwise, you live with this curse of rage all your life. I think that's part of the story. I think that's part of the story. Does that make some sense? Good. Someone else have a question they've been dying to ask a rabbi? It's free for the next 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> this question, you have the mic, rabbi. Right here, and then I'll go back. Wait, wait, there's a microphone. You don't have to shout. The gentleman is right here. Thank you. Tell me your name, sir. George Bloom. Hi, George. Welcome. What, uh, what grade did you get on that book review? I've often said, George, that I became a rabbi. It was my purgatory for all the days I missed of Hebrew school, right? It was, this is God's way of saying, you were such a lousy student in Hebrew school, I'm going to make you go to Hebrew school for the rest of your life, right? So that's what I do now is I, I became a Jewish educator just to get even, right? I don't remember what grade I got. I'm still writing it. I'm still trying to figure out what's the narrative arc of Jewish existence. Yes, please. What's your name? Noah Tepperman. Hi. So how do we reconcile the miracle of sovereignty and the, uh, the third major event, uh, which is the ongoing nature of the sovereignty, with the, the meaning of Judaism? The through us will the world be blessed and the struggle uh, of the nature of the politics of Jewish existence and sovereignty. Noah, that's a wonderful question, and I thank you for that. And it's going to take me two and a half hours to answer it, so everybody sit tight. It's a whole nother lecture. L let me give you a very short version of the lecture and tell you where to go look for it, okay? Okay? The, do you all understand the question he asked? All right, so the question is this. If I can re rephrase the question. We have returned to the land of Israel as a sovereign people. We now have our own country. You all knew this, right? There's a Jewish country in the world called Israel, right? There's a country in the world that has no word for Saturday. It's called Shabbat. There's a country in the world where, you know, where, 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 where a bracha is said on, on every night of Hanukkah in the Knesset. I mean, they, we have a Jewish country. Now, the question is, how do you square the life of that country with the imperative to be a blessing to the world? Okay? And here's the interesting issue, and I'll, I'll give you a story, if you'll just forgive me for just another moment, okay? The whole idea of Israel 
the rebirth of a Jewish dream of returning to our land comes in 1895 with the publication of The Jewish State by Theodor Herzl. Herzl has this idea that the Jews have to return to their homeland. And he convenes a Congress in 1897, Basel, Switzerland. It has the august name of the First Zionist Congress. It's actually a publicity stunt. There were 208 delegates and 1,500 reporters. But the idea was this is the beginning of Zionism. And in that room at that moment, there were two visions of what the Jewish state was supposed to be. One by Herzl, and one by a man sitting in the back row, whose name was Asher Tzvi Ginsberg, but he wrote under the pen name of Achad Ha'am. Herzl had no Jewish education. Herzl was a complete Amaretz. He didn't know a thing about Judaism. He just knew one thing. Anti-Semitism is rolling across Europe. Eventually, anti-Semitism will destroy the Jewish people. Herzl saw Auschwitz in his nightmares beginning in 1896 with the Dreyfus trial. He thought it would begin in France, by the way. He thought France would be the country that would engineer the final solution and once and for all destroy all the Jews of Europe. But he knew it was coming in 1895. So he knew we had to do one thing, get Jews out of Europe. Put Jews someplace. He was completely unsentimental. Put them any place where they can be free of European anti-Semitism. He preferred Palestine, Canaan, Israel, because it's our homeland. But if he couldn't get that, he would have taken Uganda, Azerbaijan, Argentina, or Arizona. I voted for Arizona because I live in L.A. and I'd like to make Aliyah on Southwest Airlines. <laughs> if you can put the London Bridge in Lake Havasu, you can put the Western Wall in Prescott. I mean, you could, we could have done it, and we would only be fighting the Navajo Liberation Organization. Right? Because Herzl, Herzl thought that the moment demanded protecting the Jewish people. He had no pretensions to understand what a Jewish state would look like, what its culture would look like. He really didn't care. That's one impulse of Zionism. Protect our people. In this, I will say that Benjamin Netanyahu is a good Herzlian Zionist. At all costs, protect our people. Now, Achad Am, Ashut Svi Ginsburg, sat in the back of the room, shook it, shaking his head. He said, this man's an Amaretz. This man's an ignoramus. He doesn't know a thing about us. Here's what we need to do. We need to protect Judaism. We need to find a Judaism that can thrive in modernity. And, and he thought the only Judaism that would thrive in modernity is a Judaism that would be replanted in its native land. Asher Tzvi Ginsburg, Achad Am, was the inspiration for Eliezer ben Yehuda, who resurrected the Hebrew language. This is a language that nobody in the world spoke in 1897. Today you can listen to bad hip-hop in, in, in Hebrew. The novels in Hebrew, you understand the resurrection of a Jewish language the resurrection, the creation of a new Jewish culture. This was Achad Am's idea. Achad Am writes an essay called The Jewish State. And he says, what do we want? A state where Jews live or a really Jewish state? A state will embrace core, essential Jewish values. And then he made a warning, which is so prophetic. If you build the state before you do the cultural work of recreating those values, you will fall in love with the emblems of power of that state and forget why you created a Jewish state. My thesis, Noah Depperman, is I think that that argument was never resolved. Not our fault. There was a Holocaust and 70 years of warfare. But the fact is we never figured out why we have a Jewish state. Is it just simply to protect the Jewish people at all costs? Or is it a state that's supposed to express in some fashion in its sovereignty the deepest values of the Jewish people? That argument was never, never resolved. And because that argument was never resolved, it goes on to this day. I'll give you two quick examples. If you watch television, you should learn a little Hebrew for no other reason but to watch Israeli television. 
Because every night at 9 o'clock on Channel 10, there's a program called Mabat. And they pick an issue that's plaguing Israel. When I was in Israel, it was about these refugees, these African refugees that are camped out in South Tel Aviv. You know, there's 60,000 Africans, not Ethiopian Jews, African Africans, camped out in South Tel Aviv. They snuck into the country. Israel don't know what to do with them. So they have a guy from Misrat Pnim, the interior ministry. Gray pants, sandals, white shirt, open, speaking with a Romanian accent. And he says in Hebrew, don't you know that there are 70 million refugees in Africa? What? We can't house them all. We're trying to just do what we can. This is the best we can do. We have to get rid of these people or else they'll drain our resources. On the other side of the table, there's a, an activist from some NGO wearing a dashiki and a turban who says, my ancestors came here seeking justice. Their ancestors are the same. And then they evolve to one question. But we're a Jewish state. But we're a Jewish state. You know and I know that if 40,000 Mexicans tried to cross the border at Tijuana, the American army would have no compunctions about shooting them all dead. The fact that the Israelis killed only 55 is a remark, and 50 of them were Hamas terrorists, is a remarkable testament to the restraint, the ethics of the, of, of the Jewish army, right? What would happen if 40,000 Chechens tried to cross into Russia? What do you think Putin would do to them? And he has the temerity to come to the United Nations Human Relations Council and condemn Israel? Give me a break. But we're a Jewish state. We don't just shoot people coming at the border. We're a Jew what does it mean to say we're a Jewish state? This is an open question because it never got resolved. Second example, Natalie Portman. There's a prize in Israel called the Genesis Prize. Anyone ever hear of this? A couple of Russian billionaires put $100 million together so that every year they could choose one very visible Jew and give him a million dollars to spend on Stucca. I tried, I tried, I tried. <laughs> the first year they gave it to Michael Douglas, the actor. You say, wait a minute, Michael Douglas not Jewish? Apparently that's not a problem. The second year they gave it to Michael Bloomberg. You say, wait a minute, Michael Bloomberg's a billionaire. He doesn't need the money. That's not a problem either. The third year they gave it to Yitzhak Perlman. Oh, that's nice. He's a Ziskite, you know? He's a good guy. The next year they gave it Anush Kapoor, the great artist. You say, I didn't even know he was Jewish. Neither did he, but that's okay. He liked the money. Then they wanted to give it to a woman. So who did they choose? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Great! That would have been beautiful. Then they realized Ruth Bader Ginsburg was deeply critical of Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is a good friend of Bibi Netanyahu. And Netanyahu has to give the person the prize. So it would be posnish to bring a person who's a... So they decided to take it away from Ruth Bader Ginsburg and give it to Natalie Portman. Okay. You know, Darth Vader's mother. That's fine. And, and, and she, because she's Israeli and, and she's made some nice films and she's an outspoken... And then what happened is, just a couple of weeks, a day before there, she's supposed to go to Israel and accept the prize, she said, I'm not going. And the world came down crashing on her head. Now, Noah Tepperman, I'm going to submit to you that Natalie, if you could imagine a conversation between Natalie Portman and Bibi Netanyahu, it's going to sound exactly like the conversation between Achad Am and Theodore Herzl. Portman's going to say, you are brutal in your conduct of foreign policy and your treatment of the Palestinians. And, and, and Bibi's going to say, I'm doing what I can to protect my people. That's what I was elected and chosen to, by history to do. And as long as my people are safe, I don't frankly care what your judgments are about me. And you want to know something? They're both right. Because we never resolved that problem. Right? She's reflecting a Am's ethics of I want a Jewish state. And he's reflecting Herzl's ethics of, I want a state that protects the Jews. And we still haven't resolved that issue. And that's your question. And it's a beautiful question. And I honor the question. And I haven't got the foggiest idea what the answer is. Thank you very much for answering. Let me say thank you again, Rabbi Feinstein. Thank you for a wonderful evening of learning. We are so honored to have had you, to have learned with you. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the Taubman family.
And also the Groner family, thank you so much for a wonderful evening. And I have to apologize, I forgot to mention someone earlier. So thank you, Kelly, for everything that you have done to make this evening so wonderful as well. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope that you had a, a wonderful evening, uh, that you can come home with some wonderful questions and, and some conversations as we go into Shabbat together. Thank you all. Get home safely. Shabbat Shalom.